Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Schoenholz. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's panel discussion on U.S. trade policy. Thank you all for making the effort to get here on such an awful day. And I have to tell you, the effort that our panelists have made to get here is nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, we could tell you for an hour and a half worth of stories of the travel just to get here today in time for this event. Um, we'll go through that later. The host of today's program is the Center for Global Economy and Business, which serves the university through outreach to the broader community, including the academic, business, and policy worlds, as well as students and alums. We're especially pleased to have here students and faculty from all over NYU, as well as a number of alumni. Thank you very much for joining us. Today's program will last about 70 minutes. It will begin with presentations of five to 10 minutes by each of the panelists, followed by audience Q&A. We'll finish around 5.45 p.m. Please note on the screen that you can submit questions to the panel using your smartphone by going to the website www.slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, and entering the code number 6666 in the box labeled join. Anonymous questions will not be accepted, so you must provide your full name. You can also vote on the questions that others have submitted. Your votes will help us judge the issues that are of greatest interest to you. Let me now briefly introduce our distinguished panelists. And I have to say, it's very brief. If I took the time to introduce them appropriately, we would conclude the session around 7 o'clock tonight. Carla Hills served as U.S. Trade Representative from 1989 to 1993 and as the Principal Advisor on International Trade Policy to President George H.W. Bush. She negotiated the North American Free Trade Agreement and led the U.S. negotiations on the Uruguay, Uruguay Round of the World Trade Organization. Previously, she served as Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the third woman to hold a U.S. Cabinet position. Among her current activities, Ambassador Hills is chair and CEO of Hills & Company, which advises firms on cross-border business strategies and helps them manage obstacles to market access in many countries. She serves on the International Advisory Board of J.P. Morgan Chase and is chair emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations. Carla graduated from Stanford University, attended St. Hilda's College at Oxford, and obtained her law degree from Yale. Michael Froman served as U.S. Trade Representative from 2013 to 2017 under President Obama. During this time, he concluded negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership and led negotiations toward a transatlantic trade and investment partnership with the European Union. From 2009 to 2013, he served at the White House as Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs, where he was responsible for coordinating policy on international trade and finance, energy security and climate change, and development and democracy issues. Ambassador Froman currently is Vice Chairman and President for Strategic Growth at MasterCard. He received a bachelor's degree in public and international affairs from Princeton, a doctorate in international relations from Oxford, and a law degree from Harvard. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. <laughs> Ambassador Hills will now make a few opening comments, followed by Ambassador Froman. After that, we'll begin the Q&A session. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here at New York University get out of the snow, and see so many smiley faces. And thank you for your very warm introduction. And I don't have to tell these scholars that uh, these are turbulent times economically, politically, and uh, technologically. Uh, I would say that today, globalization is under fire. Uh, many people use the term economic nationalism to describe America's trade policies. And uh, that is a very sharp reversal from just a few years back. For more than 70 years, whether under Democratic or Republican administrations, uh, the United States has worked hard to open global markets, believing that the free flow of goods, services, capital, 
and ideas was good for nations rich and poor. Beginning in 1947, the United States joined a group of like-minded countries, 22 in number, to form the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. In 1995, it joined again a group of like-minded nations to create the World Trade Organization and to upgrade the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And uh, so let me just say a word about what I think we accomplished. According to studies by the uh, uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics, our opening of markets globally from 1950 to today has added two trillion, trillion dollars to our GDP. And uh, it has also benefited our allies. And our economic relationship with our allies has built a bond so that we ha can collaborate in addressing all sorts of issues that we face in common from pandemics to international crime. And importantly, the benefits of open markets are not limited to rich countries, but they very much benefit poor countries. Uh, Professor William Klein of the, uh, uh, global, the Center for Global Development calculates that it, with a poor country, for every percentage increase in trade to its GDP, it decreases its poverty by a similar percentage. And as a result, you can see the benefits as over the years we have, through open markets, lifted some 500 million people out of abject poverty. And enlarging economic opportunities for poor countries is not only a humanitarian effort, I call it the best development tool that we can find, but it also creates tomorrow's trading partners, rather like the Marshall Plan after World War II. And expanding opportunities for poor countries also contributes to global security. For when impoverished nations cannot enforce their laws or seal their borders, they become havens for international crime and terrorism. So with all those benefits, what lies ahead? In spite of the benefits that result from opening our economic markets and creating relationships beyond our borders, trade has become a really tough sell. Today, our government's focus is on trade deficits, and its primary tool is our, our uh, uh, trade uh, uh, tariffs. And uh, the administration has reached back several decades using old, rarely used trade laws. For example, uh, the 1974 232 National Security Law. In an effort to complain about China's misdeeds, and there have been, they have used the national security law across the board, which have applied to Canada, our largest supplier of steel, Mexico, the European Union, uh, South Korea, and Japan, all close allies of this country. And this past Sunday, the president received a new report from the Department of Commerce regarding the national security implications of importing automobiles and other vehicles. So uh, the question is, uh, how do we move forward? Trade questions have multiplied, including, will we reach a deal with China? We're in the course of negotiation. Le he is here this week. Will Congress approve the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement? The U. S M C A. You can remember that if you think of the Y M C A. <laughs> and if it does, when? And how to? Uh, how will our current <coughs> and uh, uh, prospective tariffs? Uh, 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 what what reaction will that get with the trade agreements that we want to negotiate with Japan, the European Union, and the U K? And uh, will Congress limit? the president's authority to use national uh, security as a justification for imposing trade restrictions in the future. 
Well, I could go on and on, but you have questions, so I'll stop here and turn it over to Mike. Well, thank you uh, very much. And I have to say, when I became USTR, one of the nicest things about it was all the former USTRs came in to give advice, and it is a truly bipartisan group. And trade has been, over the 70 years that Carly just described, one of those rare areas where there's been a great deal of uh, bipartisan uh, cooperation. I remember when I took the job as USTR, I went to see President Obama, and we talked about TPP and TTIP and all the things we're going to negotiate. And at the end of it, he said, uh, but I also want you to help rebuild the bipartisan consensus on trade. I went back to him at the end of the administration, and I said, well, Democrats hate trade, Republicans hate trade. <laughs> We've got a consensus. Uh, you know, maybe you should have been a little bit more specific about what consensus you were looking for. Yeah, so right. uh, uh, at any rate, um, I do want to thank President Trump for making trade great again. Um, <laughs> hardly a day goes by the trade is not on the front page of the newspaper or leading uh, the stories uh, in the media. And it hasn't always been that way. I think uh, there are times, I'm sure Carla would share this, when we were trying to get reporters to write about the benefits of NAFTA or trying to get the reporters to write about um, uh, globalization. And it was very hard to get reporters to do that. Now uh, you can't really miss it uh, any particular day. And I mean that quite seriously, because I think what's been missing for some time now has been a real robust debate and dialogue in the country around trade. Trade has costs and benefits. Um, we know that. We know that on the whole, it's beneficial. Um, it's beneficial for consumers. Uh, the, the, the trade agreements that Carla referred to have added about $14,000 per American family to their standard of living. The fact that you can clothe your family, feed your family, get your back to school supplies for such a small percentage of your disposable income compared to the way it used to be is an indication of uh, the impact of trade liberalization. But it does have asymmetric costs. The benefits are broadly shared. The costs tend to be quite specific and acute. And that leads to a, a very different kind of political debate. And uh, I think one positive element of what's going on right now is that there is a robust debate around trade liberalization, around protectionism, around globalization. We don't know where it's going to come out in the long run, but at least we are, we are, having, uh, we are having that debate. Uh, let me just a few of the issues that, that, that Carla mentioned. Um, we've got the USMCA, NAFTA 2.0, uh, that is uh, soon to be submitted to Congress. And um, I think it's fair to say that, that this isn't the first administration that came in saying they wanted to renegotiate NAFTA. We did the same. Uh, we did it through <laughs> TPP. Um, um, Mexico <coughs> and Canada were part of TPP. And trade policy has evolved since uh, 1991, 1992. There have been changes, uh, evolutions, interest in, for example, adding labor standards and environmental standards to trade agreements, um, issues that weren't around in 1992, like the digital economy, like data flows across borders, like e-commerce, um, now need to be dealt with in trade agreements. So um, I wouldn't necessarily object to the, the, the renegotiation of NAFTA per se. I think the result is, I'd say, a mixed bag. Uh, some positive, uh, some neutral, uh, some negative. Uh, we can talk about that in the questions. But I think one of the interesting questions will be, um, where, does it go, where does it go from here? Um, I think one of the ironies is um, Carla was responsible for NAFTA, <laughs> which is, uh, according to the president, the worst trade agreement in history. Um, I was responsible for TPP, which was uh, Second worst. calamitous. <laughs> uh, the rape of the United States, oh. in, the, in the words of candidate Trump. Um, but it turns out if you take NAFTA, the worst trade agreement in history, and you amend it by adding 85% of TPP, the calamitous trade policy, you now get a beautiful trade agreement. And that's what the USMCA is. It's about 85% TPP on top of the old NAFTA. Um, uh, there are some, of course, uh, particular changes that this administration put its fingerprints on. Uh, but if you add terrible and calamitous, you get beautiful. That's what we're learning about our, that's what we're learning about our trade policy. I think the political question going forward is, what does Speaker Pelosi do? Mm -hmm. uh, will Speaker Pelosi spend political capital to move a trade agreement, which will likely be opposed by the majority of her caucus, through Congress in order to give President Trump a win? Any one of those phrases in that sentence, I think, is an obstacle. And together, I think it's a, a significant obstacle. 
But we'll see, because I think the fear is, is that if she doesn't move forward with, with at USMCA, the president may follow through on his threat to pull out of NAFTA altogether, and that would have an even more disruptive effect on both manufacturing and agriculture uh, in the United States. And so we'll see how that plays out over the next few months. With regard to China, um, I think many of the concerns that the administration has, is raising about China are, are real and legitimate. Uh, there are concerns that uh, many previous administrations uh, worked on as well. And certainly by imposing tariffs on Chinese exports, the administration has got the attention of China's leadership who are very eager to reach uh, some sort of agreement. The question is what kind of agreement will it be? And there are really two negotiations going on simultaneously. Uh, one is what I would call the shopping list. Um, how many more soybeans will they buy of ours? Uh, LNG, maybe airplanes, maybe tractors. Um, and that's the negotiation China would like to have because it's more or less economically meaningless. They buy more soybeans from us, they buy fewer from Brazil or Argentina. If they buy LNG from us, they buy less from Qatar or from Trinidad. And uh, it's really economically uh, uh, a wash. Um, the administration to date has said that won't be enough. That um, what the Chinese, uh, the Chinese told me about a couple years ago now, as soon as Trump came in, he said, uh, we understand how important it is for President Trump to have tweetable deliverables. That was a great phrase, you know, beautiful phrase, tweetable deliverables. And they were perfectly prepared to give them tweetable deliverables, like these purchases of soybeans or, or liquefied natural gas. The question is whether they're willing to engage in the second track of negotiations, which is about fundamental changes to their industrial policy. IPR, protection of intellectual property rights, um, a real prohibition against forced technology uh, transfer, reform of the state-owned enterprise sector, uh, reform of subsidization policy. And that's a much harder negotiation to have uh, with China because from their perspective, their industrial policy has been rather successful to date. And when they laid out their China 2025 objectives, um, they, they very much viewed this industrial policy as being key to that. And that's the question now that's going on this week and next week in Washington, uh, whether China will engage in a meaningful way in that regard. There is a precedent here, uh, which is that in the, in the last couple of years, of the Obama administration, we invested an enormous amount of effort in trying to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty with China. And that bilateral investment treaty had all of those elements in it. IPR protection, prohibitions on forced technology transfer, reform of state-owned enterprises, reform of subsidies. And the question is whether this administration will go back and try and at least use that as a foundation on which, um, on which to move forward. With regard to, to tariffs and to uh, protectionism, including the national security actions uh, that, that Carla referred to, I think here it, it's gonna be very interesting to see how this plays out because tariffs are quite easy to put in place and quite difficult to get rid of. We have a 25% tariff on pickup trucks in the United States because of the chicken war of 1963 with the European Union when they refused to let our chicken in to Europe, and so we imposed a 25% tariff on their, on, their, uh, on their minivans and their trucks, and that is in place today. The president has put tariffs under 232 on steel and aluminum. Imagine the political challenge he will have right now of getting rid of tariffs on steel, mm -hmm. given where the steel companies and uh, other constituents are in that, in that debate. Whether or not he goes to the next step and put it on autos, um, it remains to be seen. It's, um, it's, it's a challenging argument to make that the importation of Volkswagens are a threat to our national security, uh, but, uh, but that is the case that they uh, will have to lay out at the WTO uh, if, and when, if and when they take that action. I think the bigger issue here is what, what are the costs of, of protectionism? There are really three costs. One are the direct costs, the fact that right now steel and aluminum and the other products on which there are tariffs coming from uh, China and elsewhere are more expensive. It hurts consumers and, and, and perhaps even more importantly, it hurts manufacturers who use those products as inputs into what they manufacture. And so you have factories in the United States closing down because the inputs that they relied on are now subject, are now subject to tariffs. So the direct costs are real and they're significant. There's the cost of retaliation which is, of course, whatever we do, the other countries are going to do to us, which hurts our exports. 
and makes it difficult in agriculture in particular, because other countries know that our agricultural sector is very well organized politically, so they know that if you're going to retaliate, the first thing you retaliate against is agriculture, because there's nothing like a pig farmer in Washington to get the attention of members of Congress. And so uh, we're finding that our agricultural producers, our uh, farmers, our ranchers are, are feeling the squeeze right now. But I think it's the third cost, which is perhaps the, 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 the most troubling, and that is the cost of imitation, which is when other countries begin to feel like it's okay to live up to your international obligations on a selective basis, that it sort of opens up a Pandora's box in terms of what other countries may do uh, at, at the expense of our interests. We see that already in countries like India, which have begun to raise tariffs um, because we've lost the moral high ground to discourage them from doing so. But we also see it in other areas, whether it's uh, Russia getting out of the INF Treaty or Japan getting out of the Whaling Treaty. When, when international obligations become something that's sort of optional, then you sort of opened a, a Pandora's box as to what the international order looks like going forward. And we're not going to really understand the cost of that uh, for, for some time to come. Last thing I would say is um, this administration has made uh, uh, you know, a signature policy out of America first, um, leaving aside its unfortunate historic uh, uh, references. Um, every country and every president puts itself first. There's not a single president in history who would have thought that they put America second. Uh, but it's all a question of how you define national interests. And for the last 70, 75 years, our interests have been defined by a creating a rules-based system where the rules basically reflect our interests and our values and we're bringing other countries into a system that really plays to our strengths. Um, now we're entering a new world where we've determined that the rules-based system isn't necessarily in our interest and where each country is going to define for itself how to pursue its self-interest and that's a really unknown area. With that, maybe I'll stop. That's great. Um, first, um, let me invite everybody who's standing back there. There are a lot of seats over here on this side, so take this opportunity to come on down. Um, I thought they were and, protesting. Or... <laughs> and, um, second, do we now, just a reminder, you can, this is now a chance to submit questions via Slido, slido.com, <coughs> uh, join at event number 6666, and you can place votes for the questions. And we're going to start with the questions uh, typically from the top. So um, let me start by asking both of you, if you were negotiating today with China, what would be your goals for the, for the United States in that negotiation? Well, first of all, I would have talked to my allies who are complaining about the same things that we are complaining about with China. Protection of intellectual property, percentage caps on inward investment. Why is it that China can invest in Germany or in Wisconsin 100%? And if we go to China, uh, we have a 39% or 49% cap. So it's a joint venture. It's particularly onerous in uh, uh, high-tech areas, uh, and we question that. So there are a ho host of things that uh, we complain about legitimately, and had we approached China as a group, Europe, Japan, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, Korea, those are all like-minded countries. They're all concerned about uh, their trade, and uh, said to China, these are the things that have to change. I think we would have had a positive outcome, particularly in the economy of today. China's economy is slowing. It is funneling a great deal of its credit to state-owned enterprises that we call zombies. It is starving the private enterprises that are creating the jobs the growth, the productivity, and the intellectual property. And so were we to go to China and say, this has got to change. Tell us on each area what you plan to do and in what time frame, and, and then negotiate that, as we have in the past. We gave Mexico five years to bring down its restrictions on corn, and then we watched it. So we could have done that, and if they refused, or they were 
they did not follow their promises. There is Article 22 in the GATT that says a nation that is injured by non-market activities of another can take action, the group action, and nullify and impair the benefits of the transgressor. China could not afford to give up trade with the with 90 percent of the global traders and the global economy. So if we had had a strategy, I agree with Mike, the objectives that we wanted to achieve were not wrong, but the strategy is something that was missing. Mike, do you want to add to that? Well, I, just to build on, I, I completely agree that uh, uh, building an international coalition to put pressure on China is really the best way to go. And again, I have to give the Trump administration credit. There's more of a consensus now, nationally and globally, around China than there has been for some time. Um, it wasn't that long ago that David Cameron and the UK were sort of running around selling nuclear plants to China and things of that sort. Now Europe is unified with the US saying there are these serious issues that we have to address. And I think we Come could have- to the right side. It's we, we could have uh, very much built an international coalition of support. And, and I, 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 we found that China's responsive to international pressure, particularly when it's not just the advanced industrialized countries that are putting pressure on, but when they're hearing from other emerging markets or developing yes. countries, when they hear from Brazil or Indonesia or India, about their trade practices, they're particularly sensitive because they view themselves as a leader of the developing world bloc. And so building that kind of international coalition is very important. But it takes uh, diplomacy. It takes a lot of hard effort. These things are not easy. It takes time. And it's a step-by-step uh, step -step process. I think the other parts of a coherent China policy are to use all the tools we have available, uh, including the WTO. Um, uh, we brought 16 cases against China uh, during the Obama administration. We won every case that was brought to conclusion. China modified its behavior. Sometimes it took longer than we would have liked and it was imperfect. Uh, but you use every tool at your disposal to, to, try and, uh, to try and address these issues. And then again, I think holding out the carrot of a negotiation around issues like structural reform, as we did in the Bilateral Investment Treaty, could potentially incentivize that. For the Bilateral Investment Treaty negotiations, to, to, to Carla's point, the reason why those caps on equity, that we could only hold 49% of a, of a financial services firm, the reason why that's so important is because when they force you into a joint venture, that's the lever on which the partner can extract technology from you. If you can have 100% your own company in China, then you may decide to transfer technology or you may not. Mm -hmm. That's a commercial decision. That should be up to the company. When, you forced, when you're forced into a joint venture, it may not say in law that you're required to, to transfer your technology, but in practice, we've seen over and over again that those joint venture requirements lead to technology transfer that would not otherwise be done on a commercial basis, and that's why it's so pernicious. And so the best way of getting rid of forced technology transfer is to get rid of the equity caps, to get rid of the joint venture requirements, to open up vast sections of uh, China's economy to, uh, to, to foreign competition. Um, and that, I think, again, is part of what any real negotiation should be about. Um, the next question is also about U.S.-China trade. Uh, it appears that the U.S. stock market does well when there's news that is supportive of U.S.-China trade. How do you think that will affect the administration and the electorate? I think the stock market going up uh, is a positive thing in the eyes of the administration. But we have a lot of work to do with respect to the electorate. Um, most people that uh, uh, are walking down the street, Green Street or 44th Street, um, don't have an idea of why we should care about trade. They've heard in two presidential campaigns, mm -hmm. trade is bad, it takes your jobs, and uh, we, are getting, uh, we are getting the wrong side of trade. And so you've got a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I, clearly in the 2016 election, that was uh, uh, preeminent in uh, President Trump's uh, statement. In the 2008, 
We had two respected senators running against trade um, for the presidency, and people remember that, and they don't know why they should think otherwise. The other thing I think that the electric uh, worries about is, I think, as Mike said, the benefits of trade are diffused. All of you benefit, but a few who are over here do not benefit. And uh, if there's greater competition in uh, making T-shirts, you may be laid off. If uh, the corporation is incompetent, you will be laid off. And uh, if the technology moves ahead, and so as with automobiles, I used to go on the floor of an auto company, and it looked like New York Fifth Avenue at Christmas time. People all over the floor. Today you go on, there are two or three people in long white smocks, buffers on their shoes, telling you to walk within certain lines and not kick up any dust. And it's a very different place. The output manufacturing is up, but the use of workers is down. And we have a social obligation, in my view, to take those workers and train them for the seven million jobs that are open in our country, begging for people. We should have a stipend that moves the person who is laid off for whatever reason, not just trade, but for because the actually the uh, the analysis shows that about eight to ten percent could be foreign competition. Ninety percent is from technology overwhelmingly technology. And so if we could give those people who have been laid off because of technology a stipend to move them from point A to point B, a stipend for their support while they get the 20 to 25 weeks of training that they need, and then have a private partnership, the companies that have those 7 million jobs would hire them, it would actually pay for itself because it would be an investment in the future. They would be making more money in the train jobs and paying it back in taxes. So we are, but we, haven't, we don't have a good social program to deal with this issue. And that, I think, is something we have to come to grips with. Mike? Yeah, I, think I, I just want to violently agree with... Uh, violently? Uh, violently <laughs> uh, with, 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 with Carla on, on this. Uh, it, somewhat to my surprise, I mean, if you look back at 2016 and you think about the anger that was evident in that election, that was at a time when there had been 15 and a half million new jobs created, been seven years of growth, when wages had started, been, begun to increase by two and a half percent a year for a couple of years. Imagine the anger when AI, robotics, automation <coughs> fully kick in and whatever estimate you believe from McKinsey's 47 percent to something closer to 10 or 11 percent, it's going to be much more significant than anything we saw um, over the course of the last uh, over the last couple of decades. And yet we don't have a real domestic policy. And that's, you know, you don't get to vote on technology. You, nobody puts that on the ballot. Uh, you don't really get to vote on globalization. Globalization is a, a fact of life. It's a force. Um, it's frankly a, a product of technology, the containerization of shipping, uh, the spread of broadband. You get to vote on trade. And so trade becomes a scapegoat for all the for quite legitimate concerns about job loss, about wage suppression, about the changing nature of work. And yet we don't really have a domestic policy response. And whether it's Democrats or Republicans, uh, it's, there's been a remarkable lack of energy behind coming up with a real domestic <laughs> response along the lines that Carla said, and to prepare us for whatever the impact of future technological development is likely to be in the near future. So you started to answer this, so let's just continue with the theme. I didn't answer your um, question, but I answered the one I wanted to answer. <laughs> so, so, which issues regarding trade would you say are the most important for the 2020 presidential candidates to address? Well, I think the social issues that we have uh, uh, mentioned here would be important. They're talking now in Congress about <coughs> enhancing trade adjustment assistance. but. The years in past show that that hasn't worked very well because you have to show a connection between your job loss and trade. That's almost impossible in the majority of cases. Uh, and uh, so very few takers 
So we need to uh, deal with this issue. The second thing that we need to do is get the facts out. Why is trade important? It's important economically, hugely. But it's also important strategically. Our leadership, we've been able to lead on issues for 70 years, helping to create the institutions that have maintained our peace and prosperity, <coughs> not just the economics, but the IMF, the World Bank, NATO. These institutions have made a difference in all of our lives. And uh, I worry that unless we educate along these lines, it has been threatened that we will tear up the World Trade Organization. Well, having rules governing the economic activities of the people that make up the world community is as important as having laws in New York to take care of the conduct of people in the vicinity. So this is something that we really want to keep. We want to keep those global institutions. But as an electoral issue, if you walk out of this university and talk to the first 100 people that you meet, do you care about the WTO? I worry that the majority would either say, what is it, <laughs> or actually, they don't know how to decide cases. Yeah, we ought to get out of it. And I could go through the, other, the whole long list of things from institutions to trade, to, to trade agreements, which are in a way an institution. And you take away those rules of law, you take away stability and opportunity. My guess is that um, uh, because President Trump, I think, has so successfully staked out a position of being very strong on China, protectionist, defending America's interests first and the like, that um, it's going to be very hard for Democrats to out-populist him from the other side, and that there'll probably be as little discussion of trade, per se, as they can possibly get away with. Um, but I think there will be a debate about U.S. leadership and the role of the U.S. in the world. Uh, because I think even those who may be um, uh, sympathetic to the president's uh, views on trade feel like we're losing a lot of opportunity by, in the way that we're going about executing on that policy. I mean, I personally believe that him pulling out of TPP on his third day in office was probably the most significant strategic blunder in recent American history. Right. And that American historians will look back and say, this was the moment when the U.S. gave up on Asia and left it to, the, to China to write the rules of the road for the most important region uh, in the world. Um, I think on the other side, well, people will be arguing the U.S. needs to be engaged, needs to be showing leadership, need to put our values and our interests uh, first in terms of uh, creating that rules-based system that, that Carla referred to and making sure that institutions are strong and I think that's a good debate to have. So a slightly smaller problem. How should the U.S. manage its relationship with the U.K., trade relationship, in the aftermath of Brexit? We're talking about negotiating a trade agreement with the U.K. We can't really do that until they have an agreement with Europe. And we can talk to them generally. And uh, I suspect we are to some degree. But uh, we'll have to see what the terms of the Brexit are. Um, England's going to suffer if, uh, when it pulls out. Uh, corporations of which I'm aware that have invested in England are thinking not so much of pulling out, although some are, are thinking that any expansion will be in Paris or Frankfurt. And uh, so there, when you think back over the history of uh, the great Britain, it's uh, going to be a, a real challenge going forward. And uh, you wonder what's going to happen on, May, uh, on March 29th, because there are hard positions on both sides with a political overlay that is not going to be easy to, uh, to handle. Yeah, I think I think the UK is in a tough position because 
it, on one hand, it wants to have its own trade policy, but it wants to stay close to the continent where most of its trade takes place. And it's going to have to figure out if it wants a trade agreement with us, then it's going to have to differentiate itself from the rest of the European Union. If it wants to throw in its uh, uh, lot with the European Union, it's not going to be able to have an independent uh, trade policy. Um, I used to, frankly, joke with my European EU <laughs> counterparts about the UK joining TPP just as a way of needling them that if they didn't move ahead with TTIP faster, the UK would have free trade before they did. Now that's UK policy uh, to join uh, TPP. And it turns out they have an island halfway between New Zealand and Peru. There's a little rock called the Pitcairn Island where the descendants of the HMS Bouncy live, four families, 50 people, and it's a British, uh, it's a British island. So they are a Pacific country and they <laughs> want to be part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there's a debate going on among the TPP countries about whether they should let them in. Um, okay. Uh, earlier today, you described the uh, USMCA, YMCA, I won't forget <laughs> that, as a mix of a, ter a calamitous policy on top of a terrible policy. Um, it's so, not our description, that's just the president's description. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so how would you compare USMCA to NAFTA, um, and what do you think Congress will do with it? Well, those are two big questions. Uh, uh, the... Uh, MCA has some positive features, as uh, Mike has mentioned. It has borrowed those positive features dealing with digital commerce and uh, protection of uh, intellectual property, upgrading it to deal with the new technologies and a host of other things to uh, upgrade, and it desperately needed an upgrade. If an agreement is 25 years old and technology changes, we need to deal with that. Um, so that is the plus. I think one of the minuses that I see is the rules of origin for automobiles. Uh, there's a, we raised the rule, that the rule that requires autos to have North American content from 62.5% to 75%. That's pretty high. But then we went on to say that 45% of that 75% has to be workers who make $16 or more per hour. And 90% of our exporters are small and medium-sized businesses. They make a part. They buy a widget from here and uh, something from there. And uh, they will just look at that and say, I can't deal with that. 40% has to be, and I, I know I hire Joe and I'm Jim, and, but it's just too complicated. And what I think they'll say is, let's forget it. Uh, well, the tariff on autos and auto parts in the United States is 2.5%. I'd rather pay the 2.5% than to have to deal with this red tape. And what I worry about is that the administration this administration would say, well, that's why I have 25% tariffs that I'm going to put on autos, so that that is the club to hit you if you try to circumvent my rules. So that, I think, is a detriment. I think it's going to be very hard for smaller businesses uh, that uh, provide the majority of jobs in our country, and we don't need to do that. And uh, there, uh, I, I would not have the, uh, I think it was better that we have, we're going to review it in six years, and if nobody complains or pulls out of it or so forth, then it's a 16-year. But I would have rather just had it be an agreement with no pull-out clause, I don't, or because it, a, a, a government may pull out of an agreement, as we have noted, Without, what, regardless of the clauses that are in it. So the, there are some pluses and there are some minuses. And uh, I think politically it's going to have a really rough sell. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has not said where she stands on this agreement. And uh, many of the Democrats have said they want stronger labor provisions, greater enforcement on the uh, environmental provisions, and some Republicans have complained about the uh, intellectual property on biologics 
And uh, so you have a, a list of things that people have complaints about. But it's impossible, I think, to go back and say, I want to reopen it. Uh, so what I worry that the president will do is to say, if you don't take my wonderful agreement that has gotten rid of the worst agreement that's ever been negotiated, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out of the NAFTA. So you have either nothing or the MCA. And uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we do that. But there's another factor here in terms of timing. I don't think we're going to get a vote on this until at least the second half of this year. And that's because the shutdown of 35 days delayed the International Trade Commission report that must be given to the Congress on the economic effects of the agreement. And the Congress has legislative days into which to consider it, and we're approaching the uh, summer. So again, you get another delay. Canada and Mexico have said they won't vote on it until we do it. They're not going to be stood up. And so I think we've got a rough political road ahead. Again, the remedy, in my view, is an education. We have to get the word out. Why do we care about having a trade agreement with our northern and southern neighbors? Well, Canada is our largest export destination. Mexico is our second largest export destination. Together, they're a third of our global exports. And uh, they are also, have been in the past, very good uh, neighbors. We share in, uh, uh, intelligence with them to uh, enhance our security. We work together in a number of areas. And uh, if we want to pu uh, put up a wall and a buffer against our northern and southern neighbors, we will be much less well off in my view. So I think one of the interesting things about the USMCA is um, what it means in terms of uh, the administration's vision of global economy and the role of, <coughs> of, of international investment. Um, every administration wants to drive more economic activity to the United States. Every administration wants to increase manufacturing here and increase exports. Um, but most administrations have had the view that if we enter into free trade agreements, we create good rules, um, because we're such a strong economy, we've got great rule of law, we have a very entrepreneurial spirit, we have great universities, there'll be activity here and then we will open exports to other countries. Other countries have bigger barriers than we do. This administration has sent a somewhat different message, which is we don't really want American firms investing abroad. And we want to create uncertainty. So whether it's the sunset provision that Carla referred to where this may go away in six years, uh, or whether it's the investment protections that have been part of every trade agreement and bilateral investment agreement for 50 years that were taken out of, of, of NAFTA for the USMCA that help investors abroad have recourse to neutral international arbitration so they don't have to rely on going to a domestic court in Mexico to sue the Mexican government if the Mexican government expropriates their property. Um, those are out now. And so I think the strategy has been let's make it harder for American firms to invest abroad and that will help drive more activity in the United States. That's a coherent view. It, it may not be, be the right view, but it is a coherent view. What's interesting is that if you look at, go back to your China question, a lot of what we're talking to about in our China negotiations is how to make it easier to do business in China. And so there's a, they're sending mixed messages as to whether we want American firms to feel insecure abroad and therefore relocate to the United States, or whether we want to change the rules in places like China to make it easier for American firms to operate there. And I think our trading partners are somewhat confused about what our particular perspective is. Both of you have spent a significant portion of your careers trying to educate people about the benefits of trade. So Very successfully, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about to ask, which, F, uh, which mechanisms do you think have been most effective? And I'd, I'd add to that, um, what role do universities have to play in that education process? Well, universities are hugely important. And uh, I think starting at the local level is enormously important, too. 
I'm a big believer that if you can persuade mayors, uh, councils in various areas, and the local corporations, rotary clubs, uh, that they have a much better voice than any of us have in Washington. And, uh, and they make a difference. You know, when they do these polls and people are ignorant and do not know why trade is a benefit to their nation or whether it is a benefit to them, uh, the, uh, it, it helps to get the word out. And we don't have courses in lots of places that deal with trade in a, uh, in a holistic way so that you are literally educated about what is at stake. We may make mistakes about not ca carrying through on some of the things that we should do, but there it's even more important to have the education so that the generation to come says, look, I recall and I believe and this is the way I would recommend it being done. But uh, we have kept trade kind of in a capsule in Washington, and uh, I think that's a big, big mistake. Yeah, I, the only thing I'd add to that is um, it's not an entirely bleak picture when it comes to public opinion. Um, unfortunately, it, it, there's a difference in, in intensity, but uh, you now have the vast majority of Americans thinking that international trade is good. For the nation. For the nation. Um, they've off, for, for years, they've understood that it's good as a consumer, but now a majority believes that it's good in terms of helping to support well-paying jobs uh, in the United States. And you've got some interesting dynamics. I mean, the, 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 uh, the fastest growing support for trade comes from young Democrats. The fastest, grow, the fastest sinking support for trade comes from uh, middle-aged uh, male Republicans. Um, and if we looked at it, and you saw that I think in, in 2016, sort of play out at least the, the, the Republican, uh, the, the Trump's um, base of, of support being quite anti, quite anti trade. But there's some hope in that because uh, young people are more likely to have a passport, believe that they're going to live abroad, work abroad, or have connections internationally than their parents and grandparents, and therefore are more open to seeing international trade as an opportunity. Uh, rather than uh, rather than as a threat, you've also got some strange political dynamics. President Trump has done something that neither President Obama uh, nor maybe President Clinton could do, and that is 71 percent of Democrats now support NAFTA. <laughs> um, uh, that's unprecedented, and uh, because he's against it, they're for it. But you'll see, we'll have to see what the long-term perspective is as again people debate these issues and decide really where they stand on some of these global concerns. Only 71%, long way to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll take it. So how should we choose between multilateral and bilateral trade arrangements, especially when we're dealing with large economies? Well, I believe in both. Um, I am a multilateralist at heart, but the question is, how do you, what is the path through the thicket? And I recall when we were negotiating the Uruguay round, which was the eighth round, and it uh, was the round that created the World Trade Organization when it finally got finished. It was started in 86 and didn't take effect until 95. So it wasn't an overnight deal. And uh, it collapsed in Brussels in 1990. And we thought it was going nowhere. We began the negotiations of the North American Free Trade Agreement in June of 91. We completed it 14 months later in August. Bush Sr. signed it in December of 92. And President Clinton got it through the Congress in 93, and it took effect in January, January 1, 1994. Within four months, all trade, all then, 126 trade ministers came back to the table, borrowed the provisions governing intellectual property, services, protection for investors, and a dispute settlement mechanism, which was what created the World Trade Organization. And uh, the, so a bilateral or trilateral trade agreement can be a model, a preeminent model for multilateralism. So I like both of them. I hope that we 
spread the good word of good bilateral, trilateral, plurilateral agreements and have rule of law governing our trade that cover all nations, now 164 in the World Trade Organization. Yeah, I think, uh, I, again, I completely agree. Uh, this is a very boring panel because we're always agreeing, <laughs> with, we're agreeing with each other. Yeah. Um, but we took a page out of, out of Carla's playbook in, in thinking that uh, if you did TPP, that we look, was on the road towards getting about 40% of the global economy. You did TTIP with the EU. Um, there were countries that were going to join both of them. You'd have about 75% of the global economy abiding by some set of high standard rules. That, that would then spur on, hopefully at the multilateral level, it makes it easier to bring China, India, Brazil, some of the others into rules when 75% of the global economy is comfortable with them. What's changed, I think, uh, since, since China's accession to the WTO and, and, and more generally is, as Carla said, you have 164 countries. It works on a veto system. There are lots of, of potential spoilers around the table. And they, it's not just potential. They have spoiled. They have stood up and broke the consensus and prevented negotiations from moving forward. So it's very hard to get a big round done now at the WTO. Uh, because of China, India, Brazil, any number of other countries who are, are Cuba, Bolivia, willing to stand up and, and prevent a consensus from being achieved, which is why these bilateral and plurilateral agreements are so important. You get a coalition of the willing, willing to sign up to high standards and then try and inform the multilateral system. Um, so referring to the multilateral system, the WTO has been under attack. Um, are there reforms that you would advocate for the WTO, which, or if any? Absolutely. Uh, it is 25 years old as well as the NAFTA is 25 years old and needs to be upgraded. Uh, there are many things that uh, we have today that uh, we didn't have 25 years ago. You didn't have cell phones and all your iPads. You didn't have those. So our rules are deficient in terms of uh, dealing with today's economy. And so we could take some of the rules out of TPP, as Mike has said, and uh, upgraded the WTO, had rules to govern those sectors of the economy that are new to us, including some new services. And I do think that on the enforcement mechanisms that uh, we needed to upgrade those. Uh, there is a provision that if you give a subsidy to uh, a company in your country, that you must give notification of, uh, that, of giving that subsidy. Well, China has failed to do that. But it isn't the only one. Some over 30 countries have failed to give notification. And there are a lot of things that China is doing that we object to. The subsidies going for commercial purposes to companies that are state owned. Now, China is not going to change its government. It's going to maintain the Communist Party. That is its preeminent number one objective in my view. But its number two objective is to have growth to maintain stability. And I do think that we could persuade it to, that it would enhance growth were it to support the kind of reforms that it should do and others should do. Uh, and the alternatives are that it would suffer greater uh, uh, in terms of outcomes. So uh, there are things that the WTO needs to do. We already have two groups, the United States, Japan, and the European Union that are coming up, focus more on the enforcement so far, but, but uh, are having a little bit of trouble agreeing uh, internally among the trio. And then Canada. Uh, uh, gathered 13, uh, uh, including the European Union, uh, in Ottawa last fall and came up with a series of things that they're really working on and trying to persuade the membership to move on. And I think th both of those efforts uh, should be applauded. Just to be more specific, the current trade representative has been a prominent critic of the WTO and has even objected to naming or advancing uh, judges to act on WTO cases to limit their role. Um, 
Is that bringing, a, are we seeing the end of the WTO in practice? Well, I think there's a, there's a risk of that. I mean, the WTO does three things. It, it negotiates trade agreements, it monitors trade policy and subsidies, and it does dispute settlement. Its negotiating function sort of ground to a halt with right. the Doha round, and we were able to get a few agreements through, like the trade facilitation agreement or some agricultural agreements, but in terms of big rounds, it's very hard for that to really proceed. As, as Carla said, its monitoring function has been hampered by the fact that other countries don't necessarily live up to their commitments to inform the WTO of their subsidies or their other trade policy practices. And we, we all used to say, well, at least we have dispute settlement. At least that's working well. Um, now, it's not perfect. I think some of the reforms that the administration's put forward are, are, are legitimate in terms of making sure that these appellate body judges don't make up new trade laws, make sure that they actually uh, finish their cases in a reasonable period of time and don't drag them on for years, even past their terms. Um, I think there's some legitimate things there. Now, we raised some of the same objections, but we didn't stop the whole system from working. And the concern is that I think as early as September, uh, there will only be two members left of the appellate body, and you need three to constitute a panel. So that's not so great. Um, and uh, hopefully they'll find a way through on some of these reforms to begin to appoint new appellate body members who can live up to those, uh, to those rules. Okay. Um, question about the relationship between trade policy and human rights issues. Sometimes they've been connected, um, sometimes not. Are there examples of successes or failures uh, on that front in that relationship? Well, they've tried to put uh, uh, labor into the more recent uh, trade agreements, uh, TPP, uh, MCA, and so forth. You know, we have the International Labor Organization, and if you read the charter of the International Labor Organization and the World Trade Organization, there is a commonality. And uh, the question in many people's minds uh, are, uh, why can't we energize the ILO. Why do we have to keep pulling, putting things in trade that uh, uh, ministers are going to object to so we can't get a consensus? The WTO only rules by consensus. You have a big group and you have one who just won't go along, you got yourself a problem. So uh, uh, if you keep adding environment, uh, labor, social issues, some say, you know, that, that really uh, uh, creates a problem and you weaken the trade. Others say, no, 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 you can't have trade without having good labor standards. And uh, so we have been debating that for probably a couple of decades. But uh, there are options like working with the ILO, making it more effective, having a dispute settlement mechanism that's more effective than, than it is. And, uh, uh, or having the rules that we have that put in some of the agreements that we have, which are perfectly legitimate. So and you can do both. I'm a, I'm a big fan of using our trade agreements and the leverage the trade agreements give us to push labor and environmental uh, protections. And I think uh, uh, it, does, it doesn't go as far as all human rights to your question. But it goes to practices that create an, an unlevel playing field when it comes to trade. If our worker, if our companies um, are regulated in a certain way, and if our labor markets are structured in a certain way, and they're competing with firms where there's no minimum wage, there's no right to organize, there's no collective bargaining, or countries where there's no environmental protection, uh, in my view, that's an unfair trade advantage and, and ought to be dealt with. And that's, I think, how our trade policy has evolved over the years. The TPP agreement, um, I, I was ridiculed at one point, is 5,700 pages long. Um, but if you're going to read 12 pages, read the, uh, the Vietnam Labor Action Plan that's in there. It's a rather remarkable document because through TPP, Vietnam was willing to uh, allow independent unions. This is a communist country with one labor union, one official labor union. Mm -hmm. The labor union actually goes back, it predates the Communist Party. It's, it's called a fatherland function there. They were willing to allow an independent unions who could organize, bargain, strike, collect dues, elect their own leaders, affiliate with whoever they wanted to affiliate, 
internationally. And it was a fascinating process to negotiate this because at each step, they'd have to go back to the, the Politburo. This, is, this was not the trade minister who was making these decisions. This was uh, at the very highest levels of the Communist Party to determine whether or not they were willing to take their labor market in that direction. That's, I think, the potential that trade agreements have. Now, of course, that didn't move forward uh, because the U.S. was going to be the only country that really enforced that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great loss that we had, weren't not able to use TPP to help improve the lives of workers in Vietnam, which would have been good for them and the dignity of work, but also good for our workers who were competing with them on an unlevel playing field. And I think that's where I think trade can play a, uh, a very important role. Okay. I'd say one other thing about human rights, and, and Senator uh, Ben Cardin, um, a Democrat from Maryland, uh, has been a strong proponent over the years of human rights and linking human rights to trade. One of the issues we worked with him on was the whole issues of, of governance. It didn't deliver, it didn't deal with human rights directly, but it dealt with creating transparency in the way that, that, that governments acted and having governance requirements in trade agreements about transparency, about accountability, all of which help improve the system of rights as well, um, even if you're getting at it initially through an economic lens. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna come back to China since it's <laughs> big and, and, and right in the headlines. So, um, Made in China 2025, what should be, if any, the concerns of the United States with that program? I think that the uh, uh, subsidies channeling money uh, to, US, uh, to Chinese companies, uh, primarily state-owned but not entirely, uh, is, is a concern. You know, Germany had Germany 4.0 where it gave subsidies, but uh, investors could participate in the program. It wasn't discriminatory. And uh, we're at a, a stage in our development where uh, technology is changing rapidly. We are spending a lot of money to deal with these sorts of things. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something that we really need to deal with. But uh, if China wants to stay within the World Trade Organization, there are two basic norms, non-discrimination and national treatment. And those are the two that underlie all the rules. You've got to treat the investors, the traders, the people from out beyond your borders in a similar fashion than you treat your own. And uh, you can't have favoritism at home. And uh, I do worry that uh, that is a problem with uh, China 2025. Nothing wrong with a country saying, I'm going to be a leader in space. I'm going to be a leader in AI. But uh, uh, it, it can't be exclusionary and uh, are not uh, discriminatory. So I think that's one of the big problems. I think it's the combination, as Carlos said, there's nothing wrong with countries having major aspirations. But if, if you're achieving those aspirations by, one, keeping your market closed and protecting your domestic industry, two, illegally subsidizing them, and three, creating a mechanism by which um, either IPR is um, uh, infringed upon um, or technology is forcefully transferred, uh, well, that's just not fair. No. And I think, I think it's really one of the fundamental challenges we face that I, I, I'm not aware of any real consensus about how to proceed. Um, it's not the Thucydides trap that Graham Allison writes about, about the rising China and uh, an existing U.S. power. Is it inevitable that there'll be a war? It's more that, that how do we accommodate um, a China that it pursues a very different set of industrial policies into a global economic system that is based on a different set of rules? And um, if we cannot accommodate that, then are we going to find ourselves disengaging and seeing China go in one direction and the U.S. and, and Western Europe going in a different direction, whether it's about creation of technology, the establishment of standards, and what will that mean, really, for the world? We, that's really unprecedented. We've been in this world where everything has become more and more integrated, but it's become more and more integrated based on the notion that we would all follow the same rules. And we're now facing a fundamental challenge because China has a very different set of what's appropriate for its national interests. 
And it, it comes to a certain degree at the expense of the rest of the world. And the rest of the world has not yet figured out how to either accommodate, adjust to, or as we're now struggling with, prevent that from happening. Uh, two more questions. One is also about China. Um, which other countries besides the United States and China are most affected by progress or the lack of it in U.S.-China trade negotiations? Well, I think the global economy is affected uh, entirely. But uh, in Asia, you know, the, uh, they're very nervous about uh, the uh, disruption uh, between uh, uh, the United States and China. They trade with both of us in a major fashion. So, uh, uh, and so is Europe. I mean, you, we are a globalized economy today. And when you take the uh, uh, fuss between the two largest economies that make up the global economy, uh, the uh, ripple effect is felt uh, in every region of the world, in my view. And again, I think that uh, uh, we were at a, uh, a kind of a propitious point where we, I do think that we had greater persuasion power with China, both acting as a, uh, an aggregate, a, a group of like-minded nations, but also in their own interests. Because if you look back to uh, 1979 with Deng Xiaoping, you had gradual improvement in the economy. Up until about 2005, and then it leveled off. And then 2012, it has actually declined. Nobody disagrees with those figures. But uh, its decline must stop or there's going to be, uh, as some authors have suggested, some kind of a, uh, eruption in China. And I think that uh, if they were to permit the private sector, which uh, is not revolting against the Communist Party, and we have done business with communists, we've already talked about Vietnam. We have trade agreements with countries whose governments are not at all like ours. I think we could work out a plan that was a win-win instead of I win and you lose or what I worry about, we both lose. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that uh, China has been the dominant economy and power in the region for 13 of the last 15 centuries. And so from China's perspective, it's simply regaining its historical role in the region, if, if not the world. And every country, including the US, and certainly every country in Asia, uh, needs to have a positive and constructive relationship uh, with China. I think the challenge that we're facing is uh, China has a very coherent regional strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative, it's got RCEP, it's got the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, it's building islands in the South China Sea. Um, it knows what it wants to do regionally, and uh, we don't. Uh, we had one, but we don't have a coherent regional strategy. We've created a void, we've created a vacuum, and I think this would have happened, China's rise, um, I think, would have happened anyway. It was moving in that direction, but I think it was the combination that China was ready to stand up, as they say. No more hide your um, uh, strengths under a bushel or whatever the Confucius phrases, and uh, it's time for China to stand up, or China 2025. Uh, but if the combination of us creating this void and China being ready to exert itself regionally, I think has really created a, a very significant shift strategically in the region and, and the world, and it's something that we're gonna have to, over time, deal with. Well, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists <coughs> for the discussion. I just want you to know, once again, the struggle of getting here was not trivial, and we owe them a great deal of thanks for just arriving in the nick of time. We made it. Uh, last note, uh, please join us again on March 6th. Uh, we'll have former Treasury Secretary uh, Robert Rubin come and join for a fireside chat, uh, and we'll address some of the same issues. Thank you very much for coming out on this difficult night.